Certainly true. Reynolds. The economy would grow, but the benefits, the growth would be captured by the factors of production that are not based on labor. It would be captured by capital. In other words, it's the sort of thing where if you suddenly have a vast increase in America's population, population of workers, the economy will obviously be larger. In other words, there'll be more goods, more services, more people buying things. And it's also true that those tens of millions or even maybe hundreds of millions of foreign workers would be much wealthier in the United States than they were back home in China or India or Africa or wherever they were before. But ordinary Americans, the existing, the current Americans, would be dramatically hurt by it. They would be much poorer. So what it really comes down to is whether it's important to safeguard the prosperity of ordinary Americans, even at the expense of decreasing the impoverishment of tens or hundreds of millions of people from overseas. I mean, again, the numbers involved would be gigantic. If we had a policy right now that anybody could take a job anywhere, I think we'd be talking about 10, 20, 30 million people coming to the United States in the first few years of something like that. Again, people right now are earning a dollar an hour, 50 cents an hour, 10 cents an hour, and if suddenly they could earn $7 an hour in the United States, it would seem awfully good to them. Brian, the Brian people Kaplan. who employ them would drive down the wages and ordinary workers would be tremendously damaged by Brian it. Brian Kaplan, I think he just described your fantasy sure. come true. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the problem is that Ron keeps talking about labor like there's only one kind of labor. So everyone in, everyone in America is identical to everyone else on Earth, so you could be replaced by any, uh, whatever job you're doing by anyone on Earth, but that, of course, is not true. There are many different kinds of labor. Rich countries tend to have much more skilled workers. So uh, you should expect that skilled workers would be among the beneficiaries of the increase in the supply of lower skilled workers. Now, does this mean that every American will gain? Uh, that is much less clear. That's where I said if it's only a minority of, of Americans who are losing, then it is very feasible to say we will, so we will charge you an admission fee or a surtax and give you some compensation. But what uh, Ron is talking about is keeping out almost everyone on earth and losing all these benefits that we could otherwise have and, of course, trapping most of the world in poverty for no reason. And, and come to you, Ron. Ron mentioned the declining or the stagnant wages of the last 40 years and suggested that immigrant labor supply was the problem. There was a much larger change in the labor market over the last 40 years. It's called women entering the labor market. Uh, my question for Ron, so do you think that women entering the labor market was a bad thing for the economy? Was it bad? Was it all, did, did all the gains go to capital? Was it bad for men? I'd like to know. Well, I, actually... The <laughs> <laughs> That's not uh, why actually, wages have declined. That's an interesting point. But, I mean, when you look at... Whoa, 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 whoa. Not an no, interesting point, but change no, the subject. No, no, actually, no, 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 Let me respond. I wanna, that's let, a pretty let, good let question. Me respond. The sort of wage sectors that have seen sharp declines are not necessarily the ones where there's been a large entrance of women. So I, I tend to doubt that the entrance of a large number of women in the labor force is really the main factor involved. It's a complicated issue, obviously. Yeah, it's very but, complicated. But the bottom line <laughs> is that incomes have declined, and it, it's simply due to job competition. Now, Getting back, though, to the point that there was a lot of discussion about regarding the internet, I think it's. I do want to respond to Vivek on that, and I and I, and in a way to uh, agree, but it's not a question of anyone being able to take a job anywhere because this can only work under two kind. It, it can only work two ways. It can work anarchically, which is what I've been arguing against, because that's what's implied by the proposition: is anyone anywhere or it can work under highly regulated circumstances. Sweden has a labor market policy that is anyone who, who is offered a job in Sweden by a legitimate employer can come to Sweden, do that job, live in Sweden. Sweden has a very high tax, highly regulated um, and high benefit society, which I think it actually sounds pretty you good. You don't copy everything. You but don't have to have high taxes. You have relatively low taxes, and you have a high minimum wage. Problem you fixed. Can't, you can't Yes, you can have, do that. And, and Ron has demonstrated you can do that. You need to debate I your own you, I here. think you then get into the arbitrage problem. You know, can you, you do not, the not term if you fix arbitrage it for folks yes, who don't get it? When, some, when somebody is uh, basically taking the difference between a wage here and a wage there and 
uh, creaming out part of it for their own benefit. This is what happens in international recruitment with these very high fees that are paid by. Yes, Ron, and, and, need the to to your and the reason why that's Brian possible Kaplan. is precisely that it is not legal for them to go under most circumstances. No, this is yeah. le- ah, these yes, are legal it, workers. It, these if, are legal uh, workers. Under most circumstances, most of the, uh, there are very few jobs in Sweden where someone would want to hire someone from an, from another country if they're low skilled, precisely because the regulations are so strict. The re- again, remember the, the whole point of Ron's proposal is to price out most people on earth from the U.S. labor market. He says this. So when you talk about the poor conditions of workers in other countries, remember, Ron's proposal is designed to keep them poor at home. Is that true, Ron? Not, that's not true. Well, n- not, not really. In other words, I mean, again, it's a very, it's a very simple issue. <laughs> it, it's a very simple issue. When you have billions of workers legally able to come to the United States and take every, any job they can that they're offered, you're really converting, again, the minimum wage into a maximum wage. Because basically very few people in the United States under those circumstances who do ordinary jobs would ever get paid more than the minimum wage. No, 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 but you've already said that. His, right. question, his point was that you, you want to you lock out the poor. That's right. That's what he said. And I always said, is that true? Well, it, again, it depends what you mean. In other words, if you're talking about preventing tens of millions of people coming here and driving down wages, yeah, that, that's certainly true. I, I'm trying even, to prevent that. Even though that. they are living in total misery back home and they would be earning five or ten times, oh, or ten times you know, as much it, as they It's perfectly here. true. If you allow an unlimited number of foreign workers to come to the United States and take a job under any circumstances, those foreign workers would benefit. They would end up being much more prosperous than they are right now. But ordinary Americans would be hurt at the same time by a comparable amount. Oh, so, I stop there. Brian, is sure. that true? Yeah. Okay. No, it is not. So if you want to get an idea Well, well no, about, I mean, it sounds yes, extremely yes. plausible. Yes. Well, well I, <laughs> yes. So since we're, since we're in New York, let's talk about one of the greatest open borders experiments in history, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico started out as a third world country when the United States beat Spain. There was open borders. What has happened? Well, first of all, about half of Puerto Rico left over the course of 100 years. Secondly, Puerto Rico is now one of the richest countries in the world. What happened? Uh, people in Puerto Rico who otherwise would have been stuck in a third world country, not able to use their skills, many of them left and found that there was a better place for them to work. And those remaining found that their wages were higher. A lot of what happened was that Puerto Ricans went home and turned a third world country into a first world country. There's no reason that America cannot do for the world what it did for Puerto Rico. The whole well, world? What, one difference for the world. Is, what, one, yes. difference really? is, one, one difference is that Puerto give Rico... Me century, is, give me a century and I will give you prosperity over the surface well, of the earth. You got it. We will, we will meet you here. <laughs> Let's go to... Well, I think, um, you know, our um, governments are obliged to discriminate in our favor. Um, that's part of the responsibility of government. That's part of the reason we have governments, um, to keep uh, external forces from, uh, from attacking us. That's why we have a national defense. And we have national labor market policies because we want to establish a certain level of living in this country. We don't want people to be paid $2 a day for their work in this country. We don't want uh, people, we, we don't want workers' rights to be flouted at will. So we, we have rules, we have regulations, and we, have, we exert some control over who and what kind of people can come. Let's hear Brian Kaplan's response. I'm just trying to imagine Kathleen going to Haiti and telling them, look, we need to keep you out because if we let you in, we'd have to give you free health care, and I don't feel like doing that, so you have to stay here. Then that way we can maintain our standard of living. It just seems like to anyone that was not already inside of your in-group, this argument would be totally unconvincing because it would be so obvious that you really just don't care about them, and you're willing to do almost anything to people outside of your group. I mean, let me, let me put it this way. Uh, when parents are judging a sporting event, they take extra effort to not show favoritism to their kids. Why? Because, it's what it is, because favoritism is in their hearts. What I'm saying is we need to be equally careful to not show favoritism of this kind to our fellow citizens. We need to make sure that we are treating people from other countries fairly. And this is not where we're... Let's talk about Haiti, much right. better example. I wish we knew how to do that. We I wish we had the will and the willingness the to spend in Haiti. That would solve all the problems. I couldn't agree with you more if we knew how and had the will and the resources to level the playing field worldwide. We wouldn't be having this debate because there wouldn't be a problem. There is an easy solution to Haitian poverty, and that is let Haitians in right now. If you can stand up, please, thanks. Um, I'm Jabron Sheikh. Um, I have a, a question towards uh, the 
uh, people arguing for the motion. Dr. Kaplan mentioned uh, a uh, moral uh, imperative, and in this country, we can't provide health care for our, our citizens as it currently stands. Uh, education is uh, terribly flawed. We have, uh, if we were to allow millions and even billions of people theoretically to come over here, um, wouldn't we have a moral obligation then to provide them if they were injured here, for example, or if their kids needed education? And if we're not able to address that for our own citizens, how, how would we be expected to uh, do that for other people? Wouldn't it be a little bit uh, morally egregious to Thank you for that question, Brian Kaplan. <laughs> It's a very strong question. So I ask you, imagine going to Haiti and saying, look, we know that you would love to come here and get a job. We know that there's plenty of people who want to employ you. But unfortunately, if you came, we would feel obliged to give you some further free stuff. And we don't want to give you any free stuff. So you have to stay in Haiti earning a dollar a day. That is the kind of humanitarianism that America has right now. I think that is a very poor kind of humanitarianism. The Haitians would much prefer someone who would say, I would, I'm willing to let you come and get a job. I'm not going to give you free stuff, but I'm not going to keep you away because I don't want to look at poverty. And that is really what our current system does. It creates an enormous amount of poverty, and then it keeps it away from us so we don't have to look at it. Open borders is an is a incredible solution to poverty, but it is true. You would have to look at poor people if, if, they, were, if they were to come in. That is the price we pay for actually greatly reducing the problem. Kathleen Nealon, I think the question also went to some of what you said in your opening statement. Do you like to take that? Yeah, well, I, I, I think that, again, you know, I, I don't think we want to live in a country where poverty is tolerated, and I don't think we, and in order not to have poverty in our midst, I think we have to have a framework where is the, where by the immigrants that we do admit, and we admit a lot, and I'm glad of it, and I would like to see us admit more. But I don't think that we can create the kind of framework for a good society, for the kind of society we want to live in. Our immigration policy is only as good as our integration policy, and our integration policy for immigrants that makes them part of our society on equal terms I mean, is I mean, not something we can do for the whole world. I mean, Kathleen, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So Kathleen, you seem like a very nice person. You've been to Calcutta. You know, you, know, you, know how, you know how horrible things there are. I find it very strange to say that it's so important that we not have to look at you that we're going to keep you living here in horrible poverty because you might come to America and earn minimum wage. It seems crazy to me. I want to remind you that we are in the question and answer section of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John. But that's that's the, problem. Problem. the current minimum wage is too low. In other words, right now, if you have a janitor earning 9 or 10 or $11 an hour, and if he's suddenly put in competition with 2 billion workers around the world who are willing to work for anything, his wage would immediately go down to the minimum wage. In other words, all American workers would see their wages drop to the absolute minimum, labor unions would be destroyed, and the country would be impoverished. I mean, if we had a much higher minimum wage, that problem Ron, would not be so the case. Right, wait, 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 one second. Wage. I want to sure. just hear if the, 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 the point that was just made, that in fact it would have a terribly depressing effect to be in competition with two billion workers, sounds reasonable. I want to hear from Brian Kaplan. Do you think that that's accurate? Uh, no. Uh, so here's the important thing. While it's true, <laughs> well, are you going to you're going to tell us why? Uh, abs absolutely. Good. Uh, so if they're really only one kind of labor, then Ron's story is right. You let in a ton of people, and wages go down. However, uh, Ron didn't get to the empirical part of economics, which is a really important part. Here's the thing. There are many different kinds of labor. There are high-skilled labor, mid-skilled labor, low-skilled labor. You can go and read the most respected critic of immigration in the entire economics profession, George Borjas. And all that he'll tell you is that immigration has been bad for high school dropouts. Everyone else, he says, there have been gains. Uh, so uh, when you consider the effect of immigration, it's, it's not going to be an effect upon all workers. It's going to be an effect upon a narrow segment of workers who I said you could take care of them by having taxes or admission fees for those good workers. Or minimum wages. Yes. Uh, so me, minimum, yes, me, uh, Ron's minimum wage idea is terrible, and Ron can tell you why. <laughs> uh, the, the whole point of Ron's minimum wage proposal is to keep out low-skilled workers. He says it explicitly. I encourage you to read his piece. His goal is to make sure that anyone who is not worth $12 an hour, namely most of the people on Earth, are locked in their countries where they're earning a dollar a day. I think it'd be far better if they could come here can and I earn a dollar a day. Can Hi, my name is Tatiana, and I'm an immigrant. I was born in Soviet Union, now it's Moldova, the poorest country on the continent, I think, in Europe. Glad to have you. So, excuse me. So, <laughs> two things I wanted to mention.